Hi, and welcome to the Full Moon Film Buff, episode 44. We're going to talk about The Beast Must Die from 1974. I rented this from Amazon Prime. I had not seen it before. First, as always, we're going to talk about the prominent crew and cast. The film was directed by Paul Annick, written by Michael Winder, with effects makeup by Paul Rabinger. Paul Rabinger did the makeup for a lot of James Bond movies, including From Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball, You Only Live Twice, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and Live and Let Die. The cast includes Calvin Lockhart as Tom Newcliffe, Marlene Clark as Caroline Newcliffe, Anton Driffring as Pavel, Charles Gray as Arthur Bennington, Michael Gambon as John Gilmore, Claren Madden as Davina Gilmore, Tom Chadbon as Paul Foote, Peter Cushing as Dr. Christopher Lundgren. This is a pretty impressive cast. Calvin Lockhart was the first black actor given the honor of becoming the artist in residence with the Royal Shakespeare Company at Stratford. Marlene Clark was a major actress in exploitation movies of the 70s. She got her start as a model. She's also in Enter the Dragon. Anton Differing was a prolific German-born actor who spent most of his career playing villains, often playing Nazis. We've seen this before. Charles Gray has a long filmography from over 40 years as an actor, so I'll focus on some of my personal favorites. He played two different characters, one of them Ernst Favreau Blofeld, in two different James Bond films. You Only Live Twice and Diamonds Are Forever. He will probably be best known for portraying the criminologist in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Claren Madden and Tom Chadbon were both primarily actors on British television. Michael Gambon is one of those actors that's too big for me to summarize his career here. He's won almost all the awards, Tony, uh, Olivier, Golden Globe, Emmy, SAG, and BAFTA. The only big one I see missing on his list is an Oscar. He took over the massive role of Albus Dumbledore in the last six Harry Potter movies after Richard Hatch's death. Michael passed away only a few months ago as this video was being recorded and released. Rather than overshadow Michael Gambon, I'm going to discuss Peter Cushing in the next episode since we're going to see Cushing again in the very next movie I'm watching. It does pain me a little to not enthusiastically recommend a Peter Cushing movie. I know certain people will dig this film. It's high camp. I don't want to spoil it, so I won't go into detail until after the synopsis, but I must admit that my enjoyment of the film fell short of my expectations. Visually, it's appealing, and the soundtrack does carry a distinct 70s vibe. An interesting tidbit is this film was produced by Amicus. Amicus's horror and thriller films are sometimes mistaken for the output of the better-known Hammer film production. Due to the two companies' similar visual style and the use of quite a few of the same actors, including Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. The most common difference between the two is that ha Hammer films tended to be period Gothic films, while Amicus productions were usually set in the present day, and this film is no exception. So let's tackle the synopsis. The movie begins by posing the question to the viewer, who is the werewolf? After all the evidence is presented, there will be a werewolf break, and we get to guess, looking forward to it. A black man, dressed also all in black, runs. A team is pursuing him in a helicopter, Land Rover, and via security cameras. Six of the team are armed with rifles. This is not a fair contest in any way, shape, or form. One armed man catches him. They give him another chance and let him go. After more running, the hunted stumbles out of the woods to see a posh garden party on a country estate lawn. Four hunters get the drop on him and fire their rifles. He collapses to the ground. Turns out, the black guy is named Tom Newcliffe, and he owns the whole estate. The guns had blanks, and he is not dead. Pavel was hired to create the most controlled hunting ground, and this was a test. The entire house is under surveillance by CCTV cameras, as well as motion sensors in the ground around the mansion. Pavel wants to know why. Tom hints that he's going to hunt humans. Tom Newcliffe invited a group of people, along with his wife, Caroline, to spend some time in the, his rural English mansion. The group is composed of disgraced diplomat Arthur Bennington, Jan and Davina Gilmore, a pianist and his ex-student, now his wife, Paul Foote, an artist recently released from prison for cannibalism, and Professor Lundgren, an archaeologist and lycanthropy enthusiast. Tom reveals that all of them have been accused of murder. Tom adds that one of them is a werewolf and therefore must be killed. Tom never explains how he came to know this. 
Caroline is decidedly uncool with the idea that a werewolf is in her home or that her husband has lost his mind. Tom says he will kill her if she turns out to be the werewolf. Way to set her mind at ease, dude. Jan gets to a car and makes a break for freedom. Tom catches him, thanks to his vastly superior knowledge of the estate. Jan offers himself as prisoner if Tom will just let the others go. By the way, Pavel doesn't believe in werewolves. The professor explains that lycanthropy is a disease of the glands, and that the werewolf has no choice and must kill. The professor spells out the symptoms and describes the transformation. First, the eyes turn red. Then they get itchy and hairy. Then they develop an uncontrollable appetite for human flesh. Eventually, the werewolf dies of the disease. The group is super uncomfortable, either because they are a werewolf or because Tom honestly sounds like a megalomaniac killer. Jan suggests each potential werewolf grab a silver candlestick to provoke allergic reactions, but nothing happens. All the guests are put off by the extremely rare roast beef Tom serves for dinner. It's pretty gross. Uh, the professor explains the only way to determine the identity of the werewolf is for a certain combination of elements to occur all at once, including a full moon and the presence of wolfsbane pollen in the air. Now, Tom does have wolfsbane growing in a greenhouse. Someone throws a tomahawk at Tom. Tom tracks them down, but they get away. Why isn't Pavel helping him with all the cameras? Wasn't that the whole point? Anyway, Tom exposes his guests to the wolfsbane. Still, nothing happens. Jan and Davina wander off to get some peace. Tom and Pavel spy on them. Paul is revealed to be extremely hairy. Arthur suggests Tom needs psychological help, and at this point, I agree. Tom sleeps sitting up with a loaded rifle in his hands. Later that same night, something sneaks into the woods. Pavel cannot see it on the camera, but helps Tom track it. Tom misses three shots at the wolf-shaped attacker. The beast gets around Tom and returns back to the house. Pavel's normal bullets are of no help, and he's killed by the werewolf. Tom gets even more obsessive in his hunt, to his wife's increasing annoyance. Tom gradually focuses his suspicions on Paul. Tom sabotages all vehicles, further trapping his guests. Well, I suppose prisoners is a better word at this point. Paul almost hits Tom with an arrow. Tom has also sabotaged all the phones. His prisoners are fed up with Tom. So is his wife. So am I. And I saw the werewolf kill Pavel, so I know that what's going on. At night, Tom hunts the werewolf from the air. Tom can't hit the werewolf with a literal machine gun shooting silver bullets. Tom is not a good hunter. I'm going to say it right now. Caroline's dog does attack the creature. The werewolf wins that particular fight. The creature kills the helicopter pilot. And Tom accidentally blows the helicopter up. Then Tom shoots the dog to put it out of its misery. Then he shoots a pistol off in the house to get everyone's attention. Seriously, Tom is the biggest menace in the movie. I'm kind of hoping Tom and the werewolf take each other out in the ending. Oh, and sometime in the busy night, Arthur was killed too. Everyone but Tom wants to get the cops involved. Paul tries to escape badly. He can't get past the electric fence or climb a tree. So Tom recaptures him. Then we get the werewolf break. We have 30 seconds to guess. I kind of figure it's Jan at this point. There's a whole ticking clock thing. Tom thinks it's Paul, which means it almost certainly is not Paul. Tom subjects the remaining group to one final test, placing a silver bullet in their mouth. As Caroline submits to the test, her hairy, clawed hand is shown before she immediately transforms into a werewolf. She attacks Tom. I did not see this coming. Tom kills her by shooting her with a silver bullet, leaving him very distraught and confused because Caroline was alongside him when the werewolf killed her dog, which, yeah, good point, Tom. There must be a second werewolf. Professor Lundgren deduces that Caroline contracted lycanthropy while caring for her dog's wounds through an open cut on her hand that she sustained from a broken wine glass at dinner. Tom becomes enraged, convinced that Paul is the werewolf. When he attempts to confront Paul, however, he finds him already dead. To avenge his wife, Tom enters the woods surrounding the mansion and hunts the werewolf. He finally shoots the beast and kills it. Once dead, the werewolf reverts to its human form and is revealed to be Jan, the piano, so I was right. Nice. Tom returns to Professor Lundgren and Davina. He realizes he was bitten by the werewolf during the battle, thus condemning him to inherit the creature's curse. Not wanting to be a monster, or more of a monster than he already is, 
Tom locks himself in the mansion and shoots himself in the head with a silver bullet, committing suicide and ending the werewolf's bloodline. We got the happy ending I was hoping for, after all. The end. As far as the transformation goes, we don't get a lot here. Part of the problem is the movie drags out the reveal in an attempt to create tension. The transformations, when they finally occur, are underwhelming. We see Caroline's hairy hand cut away, and when we cut back, she's in wolf form. Similarly, when Jan transforms back into human form after his demise, it's executed through basic dissolves without any remarkable flair. The lack of substantial makeup effects doesn't enhance the situation either. It's worth noting that this werewolf is of the canine variety rather than a hybrid. Now, the whole reason they hired Peter Cushing was to deliver the lore dump. In addition to portraying the more wolf-like werewolf, lycanthropy is explicitly characterized as a glandular condition in this film, distinct from neurological, psychological, or supernatural diseases. I found it peculiar that Professor Lundgren displayed such precise confidence in diagnosing the symptoms of lycanthropy and outlining methods for identifying werewolves, especially considered he had never encountered one before, and acknowledged that. The werewolves in this narrative transform per the lunar cycle, are vulnerable to silver, and have some connection to wolfsbane, relatively fundamental common defects. So, two movies, good takes on hunting. It's somewhat coincidental that two consecutive movies I've watched delve into werewolves as a metaphor for hunting. This wasn't a deliberate choice on my part. While Scream of the Wolf explores the ethics of hunting using the werewolf concept, this film specifically centers around the act of hunting the werewolf. Tom, the hunter here, is portrayed as quite unhinged. The depiction is far from an accurate representation of hunting. Rather, it's a distorted perception of how wealthy individuals engage in hunting activities. Also, Tom isn't much of a hunter. He thinks he is, and I think the film expects us to agree, but he only ever hits two targets he's actually aiming for. One of the things he hits is himself. Hardly sporting, old champ. The other is a dog that's dying. Oh, I guess he does shoot the werewolf, so he hits three things. I wasn't a fan of the contrived attempt to generate tension with the whole werewolf mystery. I understand the intention behind it, and it might resonate with some viewers, but for me, it translated into spending a significant portion of the movie waiting. The filmmakers are constrained from revealing too much information, as doing so would spoil the suspense. Consequently, the movie becomes a waiting game, signaling to the audience that there are going to be deliberate misdirections to create a sense of mystery. It establishes that the film will manipulate evidence and play with our expectations. This is precisely why I discounted Paul as a suspect. The film was exerting excessive efforts to frame him, making it clear that he wasn't the actual culprit. An additional problem with this mystery format is that we can't understand why or how Tom becomes aware one of his guests is a werewolf. For the narrative to hold together, Tom must have acquired information suggesting one of five random individuals is a werewolf, but without knowing which one specifically. This narrative inconsistency was a significant source of frustration for me throughout the movie. If Tom always knew the identity of the werewolf, the elaborate charade becomes perplexing. Why would he jeopardize the lives of his wife, guests, and employees? On the flip side, if Tom was really unaware of who was the werewolf the whole time, how did he ascertain that one of them was indeed a werewolf at all? It just doesn't make any sense. Really bothered me and hampered me from enjoying the movie. But if you like lycanthropes, like, share, and subscribe. Contribute your thoughts and additional observations in the comments below. Let me know what I missed or what you noticed. Next, I plan on discussing Legend of the Werewolf from 1975. Keep your eye on the moon, a silver bullet in the chamber, and we'll see you back here next episode.